In October of 2013, FBI seized operations of one of the largest underground drug network in the world. In this video, we will go through how Ross Albrecht, an Eagle Scout, started a side project to his online bookselling website, and how he built a global drug bazaar and became a murderous kingpin until his arrest. This is the rise and fall of Silk Road. Ross had grown up in Austin, Texas, and had always been smart and charming. He'd been the kind of kid who was an Eagle Scout and let his friend give him a mohawk on a whim. He was raised in a tight family. They'd spend the summers in Costa Rica. Ross' parents had built a series of rustic solar-powered bamboo houses there, near an isolated point break where Ross learned to surf. In high school, Rossman, as his friends called him, drove an old Volvo, smoked plenty of pot, and still got a 1460s on his SATs. To friends, Ross was carefree, but also caring. Ross earned a scholarship to the University of Texas at Dallas and majored in physics. From there, he landed a graduate scholarships at Penn State, where he excelled as usual. But he wasn't happy with the drug dirty of lab research. Since college, he'd been exploring physiedelics and reading Eastern philosophy at Penn State, Ross talked openly about switching fields. He posted online about his disenchantment with science and in his new interest in economics. He'd come to see taxation and government as a form of coercion enforced by the state's monopoly on violence. His thinking was heavily influenced by Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, a totem of the modern American liberation orthodoxy. According to von Mises, a citizen must have economic freedom to be political or morally free, and Ross wanted to be free. When he finished his masters in 2009, he moved back to Austin and got a cheap apartment together with his girlfriend, Julia. He tried day trading, but it didn't go well. He started a video game company, but that failed too. The setbacks for Ross was devastating. His friend at the time, Donnie Palmertree, invited Ross to work with him on Good Wagon Books, a business that collected used books and sold them over the internet like Amazon. Ross would build a website, learn the inventory management, and wrote a script that determined a book's price based on its Amazon ranking. Ross got into a bit of a depression. His relationship with Julia had ended and he felt lost. He wrote in a journal on his computer, I had left my promising career as a scientist to be an investment advisor and entrepreneur and came up empty-handed. Not long after this, his companion in Good Wagon Books moved on to other projects and Ross became the head of the business. He now had five part-time college students working for him and he had around 50,000 books on his shelves and made approximately $10,000 a month. The business was doing good, but Ross's libertarian interest had grown. He had taken an interest into Bitcoin. The value of Bitcoin, based only on market factors, unattached to any central bank, aligned with his advancing libertarian philosophy. In his journal, he wrote about an idea he had, to create a website where people could buy anything anonymously, with no trail whatsoever that could lead back to them. I've been studying the technology for a while, but need a business model and strategy. Ross believed that drug use was a personal choice and that no government should be able to choose for you. I was calling the idea underground brokers, but eventually settled on Silk Road. In the beginning of 2011, he decided to shut down Good Wagon Books, and at the end of January, Silk Road opened up for business. He built the website using Tor technology which made browsing the website anonymous. The payment was made through Bitcoin and anonymity was key for the operation. Ross started out selling mushrooms on the website and eventually sold all 10 pounds of what he had. But other vendors had started joining as well and the website has started to grow at a fast pace. In his journal he wrote, I am creating a year of prosperity and power beyond what I have ever experienced before. Silk Road is going to become a phenomenon. 
and at least one person will tell me about it, unknowing that I was its creator. Silk Road's usage had exploded in June of that year, after the story on Gawker brought the site the mainstream attention. After that, traffic grew so fast that Ross needed technical support to maintain the site, deal with transaction and add features like automatic payments and a better feedback system. By now, he had banked $100,000 and was earning $25,000 a month in commissions. He wrote, It's time to bring in some hired guns to take the site to the next level. Part of the problem was that Ross was grappling with what hackers call operational security, or OPSEC. To completely seal his two identities from another, Ross realized would require kind of a ruthless and elaborate secrecy. Who is Silk Road? He posted in February of 2012 to the community. I am Silk Road. The market, the person, the enterprise, everything. I need a name. Drum roll, please. My new name is Dread Pirate Roberts. The name came from the Princess Bride, in which the pirate was a mythical character inhabited by the wearer of the mask. DPR was thoughtful and at times eloquent. He wrote, Stop funding the state with your tax dollars and direct your productivity energizes into the black market. But the growth did not go unnoticed by law enforcement. And in January of 2012, a special task force by Homeland Security was set in place to find and take down Silk Road. The operation was called Marco Polo and had around 40 agents. They started to infiltrate the site and created multiple accounts both as vendors and buyers. They quickly learned that the site was run by a vocal mastermind called Dread Pirates Roberts. One of the agents, who would be key for the operation, was Karl Mark Force. He created an alias as Eladio Guzman, a cartel operative based in the Dominican Republic, whose bread and butter was moving mid-sized shipments of heroin and cocaine. Force knew how to put together a backstory from his years in undercover. As a young agent, he'd been on the front lines of the drug war. On the website, he called himself Knob and wrote a message to DPR. Mr. Silk Road, I'm a great admirer of your work. Brilliant, utterly brilliant. I will keep this short and to the point. I want to buy the site. I've been in the business for over 20 years. Silk Road is the future of trafficking. Sincerely, E. For the first couple of weeks, Knob pushed his Silk Road investment scheme, but TPR declined, saying essentially, the operation is bigger than you think. And it was, because Silk Road worked extremely well. TPR's robust stewardship was paying off. To protect against scammers, he created a Silk Road escrow where all transactions will be held until settled. DPR wanted to create what he called a center of trust. And it was this centralized payment structure that enabled Silk Road to really take off. So when Knob offered to buy the operation, DPR countered with quite a price, $1 billion. Knob scoffed, but in fact, DPR's numbers might have been low. The scale of Silk Road commissions over the next few years would in fact qualify DPR as one of the biggest entrepreneurs of the second internet boom. Besides, he told Knob, this is more than a business to me. It's a revolution and it's becoming my life's work. In essence, DPR faced a classic founder's dilemma. It would not be easy to pass the baton without hurting the enterprise. And right now, that is more important to me than the money, he messaged Knob. Force would continue his conversation with DPR. At times, they sounded like college kids getting to know each other in the freshman dorm. Knob advised DPR against seeing the latest Batman, invited him to LA for tacos, and talked about how much Latinos like the Smiths. Ross had moved to San Francisco after his friend Rene Pinnell talked him into it. I am Rene Pinnell, age 29. Today is December 6, 2012 and we are in the Jewish Contemporary Art Museum and relationship to partner is best friend. 
So, Ross, how did you come to live in San Francisco? Uh, you twisted my arm until I said, ah, fine, I'll come. <laughs> I get a phone call from Renee. Ross, call me up. I got an opportunity for you. I'm like, okay. And he's like, yeah, I'm doing the startup here in San Francisco. Um, I want you to be a part of it. The more I thought about it and the more he um, laid out the pros and cons, uh, uh, the more it all just seemed like cosmic and the right thing to do. So, um, yeah, I bought my ticket and two weeks later I, sh I showed up at his doorstep. <laughs> Ross is awed by the beauty and, and the entrepreneurial energy of San Francisco, the mecca of startups. But as far as Rene knows, Ross is just a day trader and not a drug lord. As Silk Road became a true global market, DPR revealed in his role as a leader and libertarian evangelist, he created a book club where users could polish the dogma from sacred text of von Mises himself. He talked more about a near future when our current governments would seem like ancient history along with the pharaohs and their armies of slaves. He extolled the Silk Road faithful for being on the front lines of revolution. Thank you, DPR said, for your trust, faith, camaraderie and love. He offered them hugs, not drugs, then amended it. Wait, hugs and drugs. The community responded in kind, likening DPR to Che Guevara, calling him a job creator and declaring that his name would live on among the greatest men and women in history. It was a lonely outpost, and at times, DPR wished he could meet up with his friend Nob. Instead, they shared a mix of truth and fiction about their lives. They talked about shop, site fixes, the odd holiday slump in drug sales, and the human resource problems of a clandestine telecommuting workplace. This is a big problem. To grow, DPR said, he had to build a strong workforce. A leader needs support so he can focus on the future. DPR started to build a team. He would contact some of the more active users and moderators of the site to start work with more administrative tasks of Silk Road. He would demand full transparency and the admins had to send in scanned driver's license so Ross knew who he was working with. The new employees would soon be a problem. In Spanish Fork, a small town in Utah, a SWAT team had just broken into a 47-year-old Curtin Green's home and arrested him. This would be the first arrest of a user in the inner circle of Silk Road. Curtis Green was a 47-year-old father of two who to many lived a normal life, but on Silk Road he was known as Chronic Pain, one of DPR's lieutenants. The arrest was organized by Knob, and this was the first big step in getting Ross Albrecht. But DPR was jittery, and he noticed that his trusted admin had been outlined for a couple of days. A Google search revealed that Green had been arrested, and DPR suspected he would flip. He went into crisis mode, communicating with his confidants scrambling for a solution. This will be the first time I've had to call up on my muscle. <laughs> sucks, he told Inigo, another admin on the site. Moments later, DPR messaged Nob that he had a problem in Utah that required violence. According to the backstory Force had created for Nob, his criminal repertoire included enforcements and collection talents, so he acted apart. Sitting in the Marriott, Force received a PDF of the target, opened it, and discovered a scan of Green's driver's license photo. Then he looked across the table, where at the very moment, Green was half asleep. Well, this sure is an opportunity, Force thought. DPR wrote, Never killed a man, or had one killed before. But it is the right move in this case. How much will it cost? Ballpark? Less than 100k? Have you killed or had someone killed before? Of course, DPR was right that Green had been flipped. 
by the very same man he just hired as an assassin. It was a surprising escalation. The Silk Road leader, who waxed lyrical about respecting the Silk Road community, was now pondering pricing for murder. Four staged a murder and sent pictures to DPR, who in return sent over $80,000 to Knob. The triumph of Silk Road confirmed its creators believed in its own myth. What we are doing will have rippling effects for generations to come, he wrote to his followers. In June of 2013, the site reached nearly 1 million registered accounts, but around this time, the feds finally got a breakthrough. One of the servers had a leaking IP address after a misconfiguration on the website. The IP address led them to a server farm in Iceland, and after a long flight, they were holding a copy of Silk Road in their hands. The data center also kept the system logs for six months. They could see all of the other computers that had recently communicated with this machine. One of those connection was to an IP address that was the last known login to the Silk Road VPN. A sub Huena revealed the IP's physical location, Café Luna, Sacramento Street, San Francisco. The rise of Silk Road had taken its toll on Ross. There were technical problems, management issues, a quickly changing marketplace, and the volatility of Bitcoin. There were scammers on the site. And even if Silk Road made more money, the cost to maintain it rose. His self-taught programming was catching up to him as well, leaving holes in Tor's invisibility cloak. And yet, he would tell his admins that there was nothing to get traced back to them. When one user with a technical background private message DPR to warn him that he should know the precise physical location of his servers, DPR brushed it aside. The tipster warned that their servers could be easily copied. Don't worry, DPR said, the servers are secure. In the meantime, the feds were recreating a local Silk Road and reading through thousands of messages between DPR and his moderators to try to find a clue. They were impressed by how hard DPR worked to expand and manage the site under incredible duress. They could clearly see that the site wasn't built by a professional programmer and that there were a lot of messy codes and comments everywhere explaining each feature. In 2013, they finally got a name. One of the agents assigned to Marco Polo had searched for Tor URLs around the time of the site's first appearance and found a mention in shroomies.org forum on January 27, 2011, days after Silk Road launch. A user named Altoid talked up this exciting new service that claims to allow you to buy and sell anything online anonymously. Googling elsewhere for the username Altoid revealed a question about database programming posted on Stack Overflow dated March 16, 2013, asking, how do I connect to a Tor hidden service using curl in PHP? The email listed was russalbrecht at gmail.com. In the end, one of the best law enforcement tools was Google and Ross was put under 24 seven surveillance. A quick tour through Ross' social media presence revealed a digital portrait with an incredible likeness to Dread Pirate Roberts. His LinkedIn profile was full of the same libertarian rhetoric. On YouTube, he'd favorite videos from the Mrs. Institute, the political touchstone beloved by DPR. On Google+, he asked, anyone know someone that works for UPS, FedEx, or DHL? In the lab, they found code on the Silk Road server that matched lines posted by Ross on Stack Overflow. Now they were certain they had found the guy. They watched him working late on encrypted wireless. Sometimes he headed out with his laptop, like practically everyone else in San Francisco, and occupied a cafe table 
to work with his coffee at his side. So they decided to use his physical surveillance to see if they could line up Ross internet usage with DPR's activity on Silk Road. The activity matched. DPR and Ross were in lockstep. Every time Ross turned on his computer, DPR logged into Silk Road. When he closed it, DPR logged out. Over weeks, the pattern was consistent. It was time to start planning for an arrest, but he wanted to catch him red-handed. On October the 1st, while Ross had a coffee at one of the internet cafes, close to his home, they got him. Ross was logged into the admin panel of Silk Road and having a discussion with Knob, exactly as planned. After the arrest, on his computer, they would find his diary and log where he explained most of the operations. The evidence was dooming and on February the 4th, 2015, Albrecht was convicted on all non-violent counts after a jury trial that took place in January of 2015. On May the 29th of 2015, he was sentenced to double life in prison plus 40 years without the possibility of parole. It would later be revealed that the undercover agent Frost would be prosecuted and sentenced to jail as well. Apparently, he went a bit too far into his role as knob and scammed multiple users of their bitcoins on the site. I guess it's hard to see that much money and not take advantage of it. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please hit that like button. If you want to see more of the same content, hit that subscribe button. I will have more videos like this coming out next week.